Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to um, the um, this webinar. It's um, what it's going to be. It's going to be a, a national team's perspective on um, uh, the low block. So I would like to introduce a number of people that are going to be on the call. Myself, uh, my name's Tom Curtis. I am currently working as a as a national specialist coach, predominantly with the the under 16s group. Um, the other people are on the call: uh, Jimmy Gilligan who works as an FA senior game coach developer, um, Matthew Bishop, Bishop, who's the A-licensed lead, and also we've got John Griffiths with us, uh, who's the head coach of the England women's under-16 team. Hi, guys. Everyone okay? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good, good. So um, I suppose what I'm going to do this, this afternoon is take you on a, on a, a bit of a... Um, yeah, a bit of a journey for me um, throughout throughout the season and talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been working on with the under 16s group. So I'd really like to start with um, with, with, with some work actually one of my colleagues did um, earlier on during the season, a guy called Sam Meek, who works as a, a goalkeeping coach with the under 17s group. Uh, and it really stimulated a bit of thinking for me. So he did, he's done a, a study and looked at the, the goals that have been scored and conceded in the Premier League this season. And these are some of the headline stats that I'm going to share with you now. So all this stuff is his work, it's not my work, but it really has stimulated some thought and, and, and shaped some of the stuff that we've been practicing this year as a coaching group. So 784 goals have been scored slash conceded uh, in the Premier League uh, so far this season. 85% um, of those goals have come from open play. 15% uh, of those goals have come from set plays. 65% of those have been first-time finishers. 17% um, of those goals from open play have been two-touch finishers, and 18% of those goals have been from more than two, from more than two touches. So immediately, I'm thinking, well, that, you know, that, I'm starting to look with a, with a bit of clarity about how the goals are being scored in the Premier League, and I'm now thinking, well, how does that relate to some of the chances and goals that we've conceded uh, with our group? Um, where they come from? Well, 29% of the goals from open play have come from, from crosses, um, and 15% of those crosses have come from. Uh, sorry, 15% of those goals have been scored with 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 the head, and 85% of those goals have been scored with with feet. So yeah, like I said, um, th that that's really stimulated a bit of thought for me. Um, my, my job is to look after the out of possession portion of the uh, the under 16s program. Um, so I, I decided I would have a, a real sort of close look at some of the goals that we've conceded uh, this year, uh, and 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 how that how how we've conceded them and where those um, those chances come from. So this is our these are our stats um, from from this season. Um, we've conceded. Um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the the program so far. I think that might give you a bit of context to. To, to, to some of this data. Um, our, our program fundamentally, I suppose, is a, a talent ID here at 16. So we're trying to find out a little bit more about the players. And of course, they're trying to find a little bit more about us. Um, we are working towards a, a focus. So at the end of the under 17s year, our team, as well as John's team, will will compete in the, in the European Championships, the under 17s Euros. So we are building towards that competition in around about 12 to 18 months time um, and of course there's a broader focus for us as well um, we're trying to um, uh, give the players as many a tournament sort of exp international tournament experiences as we possibly can do um, so that hopefully they'll be able to flourish at some point in, in Gareth's team Gareth's first team so um, the games that we've taken part in so far this year which have clearly been cut cut short by the by the pandemic have been um, we started off in in July, playing two games against Denmark and Ireland. Uh, we then um, had another two games a couple of months later against Norway and Scotland. We were then fortunate enough to go and compete in a um, in an international tournament uh, with, with world opposition in in uh, in Spain, where we played uh, Russia, Japan, Mexico, and Spain, the hosts. Um, it was a fantastic tournament, really uh, a really valuable experience for the players. Um, we were fortunate enough to uh, uh, to to finish second in that tournament. We we just nicked out, nicked out against Spain. Um, we had to win the last game against. Uh, sorry, we had to draw the last game. Um, sorry, win the last game against. I'm getting confused myself. 
um, to, to win the tournament. And we were three to up with 85 minutes gone. We played 40 minutes e each way. So we were five minutes into it, injury time. And Spain managed to score a, a goal in the fifth minute of injury time, which meant they drew the game. And uh, disappointingly, we, we ended up finished second and they, they won the tournament. But a great, a great experience for everybody. Uh, and then the next tournament we, we took part in, the same tournament as John's team. We played Denmark, the USA and Spain again at St. George's Park. Um, and we won all the games this time. So we, 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 we finished the, I suppose, we didn't realise it was going to be the end of our season then. But we did finish that, that tournament um, really, really strongly. So that's the uh, that's a, a bit of a, a whistle stop tour of what our our program has looked like this season. So in terms of the goals we've we've conceded, um, we've conceded eleven goals um, throughout the season, um, three of which were against Ireland quite early on in the season, uh, and we've also conceded four in total against Spain. Um, so so you, you, I suppose some of this data you could you could. You could say that some of the data is warped, but I think nevertheless, it's interesting to look where the goals have come from, against which opposition, uh, as well as where have the clear-cut chances come from, because obviously um, every clear-cut chance that the, the, the opposition team uh, creates could potentially result in a, in a goal. Um, and th those, you know, the ones that we've recorded are the ones... Um, that we feel the opposition should have should have scored from. So going through one v one with just the goalkeeper to beat um, nine, nine times out of ten, you would expect the striker to score. We would we would we would categorise that as a critical chance. Guys, have you got any questions as we uh, about any of that stuff? I've just unconscious. I've been talking for a long time. Just just, just for me, Tom, um, from Sam's. Um, you know, data. What, what did it get you? I know you said you got you thinking. What What was it you were thinking about more than anything else? Right. I, I'm gonna. I, I tell you what. It's a It's a good question, and, I, and I'll show you what I've done with the with the data and how I've how I've started to look at the uh, uh, the goals and where the, the the goals have come from. So what I've, what I've, what I did was sort of map out where the goals have, have, have come from and also where the the assists. Have come from for those goals and those critical chances. So that that that's a um, yeah that's a that, that that's a map. That's that's sort of the results of the 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 the, um, the study that I've done on these particular goals. So the A, so the little uh, dots with an A in that um, that's an assist. So that's where the assist came from. So if you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but if you see that red uh, that red A. Um, on the right hand side of the box, that is where an assist came from for a for a goal. So if it's in yellow, that signifies an assist for a goal, and if it's in white, it signifies it's an assist for a critical chance. And then uh, again, it's really difficult to see, but you'll it'll become a little bit clearer as we go through the presentation. In the middle of the box, there, if it's an F and a G, that means it's a goal scored by the feet. Um, and if it's an F and a C, that means it's a, it's a chance, a chance with a feet. Um, so H and, and G would be a headed goal and H, C would be a, a headed a headed chance. So I suppose as a result of this study, I've, I've come up with, we've, we've conceded 11 goals, I've always, I've, as I've already mentioned. But we've also conceded 18 clear cut chances. So that's one thing. But we'll try to go into a little bit more detail. So all these goals, by the way, are coming from, from open play. So um, this is a map, a little map, and, and these are where the goals have been conceded from. So um, what do you notice about that, guys? Everything's in the box. Bar one. Yeah, okay. One. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, it's a, it's a really good observation. So uh, a lot of the goals, well, most of the goals have been scored from inside the box. And um, centrally. And centrally, yeah, yeah, really good observation. Uh, and then what, only one actually out of the eleven goals have been scored from outside the box. Um, by the way, the, the, the colours are supposed to um, are supposed to align with the colours that the teams play against that we concede the goals against. So these um, these sort of maroony red colour that is uh, that's against Spain. Uh, the light blue there that's against uh, the USA. That grey one is against Mexico. The greens are Ireland. Uh, this one here, this is uh, Norway, and then the dark blue one there—that's uh, that's that's the United States. So those are the goals that we've conceded 
throughout the throughout the season. Um, eight of those goals um, have been one touch finishes. So yeah, that, I mean that was you know I, I started to think about you know how those goals were being scored, stimulated by Sam's study. So yeah, eight eight of those goals have been scored um, by a one touch finish. Uh, two of them have been scored uh, for, by by two touch finishes. So um, I think this one, this one here, that was a control and finish, and this one here, this one was against Norway. This was a um, this was a, I think this was a, a header that wasn't cleared properly. It dropped to someone on the edge of the box. I think he had one, two touches, and smacked it in the top corner. Nine of the eleven goals have been scored from within within what we call a triangle. Um, so the triangle there, there you can see, and um, that's it. Like, like Jim said, that's a that's a sort of central, a central area, and within the box, um, one of which we've talked about already. One of which of these goals have come from from outside the box. Um, ten with the feet. So ten out of the eleven goals have been conceded with feet, and um, only one with the head. Guys, you got any questions? Uh, Tom, I've got I've got one for you. Um, just in terms of the different teams uh, and the different styles, um, how did they get the ball into the into those areas? You know, what was the difference between the different teams? Right, it's a really good question, and I think I think so. So, what I've tried to do um, to sort of answer that question and think about that sort of question um, is, is, like I said, I've tried to I've tried to track. Where those uh, where, where where the goals have come from, and the way I've decided to track where the goals have come from, I've started to mark down where the assists have come from. Yeah. So um, yeah, they're the assists. So um, so the A the A here uh, in 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 a sort of dark red colour that signifies where an assist has come from for a goal that Spain have created. Um, the A in uh, in green there. That's a goal for an assist for assist for a goal from Ireland. Um, yeah. This one here is an assist for a goal from from Denmark. So so what do you know is about where those um, assists are so, so situated? The the two the two the green and the red one, Tom, for me, are are in the wider areas in let's say zone one, zone five. Yeah. So that would if if that's relating to me and correlating to what I'm thinking, I'm thinking that's one v one duels. And there would be things that I'd be looking to potentially work on with my team and with my individual players to make sure that they're capable and they're flexible to be able to deal with one on one v one situations and and even two v one situations. Yeah, yeah, no, good, good, good observations. Anyone else? Any, any any observations? I guess one of the ones for me, Tom, would be is um, the, the similar nature and characteristics to to the statistics there that are displayed in the women's game as well. So if you look at the majority of goals that are coming from Spain, they they look like they're assists from cutbacks. Um, yeah. And again, their their style of play as a nation is is transition is very similar to that. Yeah. Um, and also with the um, I guess the green of the island um, goals as well, it's almost flank play that's direct into a um, central area. And then finished from contacts within the, the penalty area. Again, very, very similar. Yeah. Go on, sorry, Jim. In, interesting on the deeper ones, Tom. The the the, the two sort of deep, well, the, the, yeah, and the, and the very deep one. Um, it would be, you know, how how do you how do you sometimes stop that coming into your box earlier? Um, yeah. and, and and causing the threat, especially if we're talking about you know what we are talking about, which is the low block right now. Um, yeah. you know, it might be that, that how can you how can you counteract that and stop that happening? Yeah, I mean this one here. This is this is the goal away in away in Spain where we were um, we were we were three two up, eighty five minutes. Uh, what happened was, uh, don't want to relive it too many times because I've lost quite a bit of sleep over this one. <laughs> but they had a they had a, a, a well we had a free kick um, in in their corner um, on eighty five minutes and we tried to keep the ball in the corner. Um, the referee uh, gave a foul against us for some reason. Um, we then dropped off really, really quickly, um, having pressed them all the way through the game. So we dropped off to the halfway line. Um, they played a short pass back to the goalkeeper who passed it out to the centre-back. One of our centre-forwards missed the press. It went. It, uh, they passed it to another... Uh, uh, no, their centre-half passed it through to, uh, to another centre-half who sent a long ball into the box. Um, 
at this stage in the game, um, what we'd done, we'd gone from our normal diamond uh, formation to a to a four five one sort of formation. So we 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 put one of the um, one of the forwards who'd be playing up front to into a wide position. Um, he he was he was he ended up too wide, which made our fullback sort of go towards his man, which which shifted our right side centre half a little bit further towards the fullback, creating a gap. One long ball, we misjudged the flight of the ball. Um, it drops to their uh, centre forward who, who, who taps it in. So I'd love to show you the clip. Um, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not allowed in in, in this forum. But uh, so much learning came from that particular clip, um, both in the way I suppose we managed the game, sort of later on during the games, and how we, you know, you know what the what our considerations may be, whether or not we change the style, whether or not we change the system, uh, the the formation when we're you know where we're hanging on by a goal. Do we do, do we hang on and, and go defensive, or do we continue to do the things we've been doing um, all the way through the game? So that was a, a big piece of learning. So to, um, to, sorry, Tom. Um, yeah, on, on. Because it's really interesting what you're saying about the Spain one, and I'm harboring on that a little bit. That, yeah. You know, you you. I know Spain will want to win the game just like you did, and you've explained where you were in terms of that 85 minutes. Yeah. But it's something that you don't, you know, you don't really know. Spain are not known for in, in terms of locking, knocking long balls. But if you were no. looking at practice design against the Spain, you yeah. know, for that, it, 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 is that something that you would then go away and look at and say, right, we need to. This is the what ifs in within the tournament. We're we're mm. you know we're we're one we're one goal up. We've got four, yeah. four minutes to go. We know Spain will go long on us. What are they going to do? How are they going to hurt us, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Yeah, that's a really, a really good point. I, I guess um, one of the processes we've got um, during during the planning time that we have for these tournaments is to is to a have a look at the opposition, so we can we can maximise our own strengths. So we wouldn't at 16s do a lot of um, we wouldn't deliver a lot of information about the opposition to the players, but for us as coaches we would look at the opposition in quite a lot of detail in order for us to sort of maximise our strengths and also for us to plan some what-ifs um, and, and also set up the team, I guess, to, to enable the players to be the best that they can possibly be. Um, yeah. But, yeah, part of the what-ifs, I guess, um, before a game would be exactly that. So how are we going to manage a game when we're 1-0 up? How are we going to manage a game when we're 1-0 down? Um, and clearly, on this on this occasion, we we, we didn't it didn't work it, it didn't work out for us. Uh, yeah. And there was like I, like I said, there was lots of learning for us as a group of staff, but also a lot of learning for the, for the players. And I guess the part of the 15s and the 16s and the 17s and the 18s program is for the players to to, to have these experiences, so they're able to um, they're able to ex execute as they sort of move into senior football. Uh, the the other thing I was going to say, and I, I think it, John, I don't know, it might relate to you know, the girls and women's game is what do you then start to profile players within your group in terms of what I, I consider to be first contactors of the ball, second contactors, you know, and, and then your tertiary players around that really? Yeah, we're, we're um, at the moment, we're just going through a whole sort of revamp of profiling individuals based on, you know, um, the, the profiles of what our competitors look like. And one of the key things, you know, you look at the statistics there, Tom, is it's suggesting that actually the importance and value of getting players that can defend competently in a low block is really important. One, you know, as Jimmy says, stopping the supply, stopping the actual ball, getting into those contact areas, but then having competency and being able to deal with the ball when it does come in and when it, and it will invariably is being able to deal with those um, contact and the interesting thing is is the number of goals that actually are, are from those supplies conceded through headed goals or attempts versus the feet so it's not just been able to deal with the first contact aerially um, with your head but it's also been able to deal with it you know from a, a lower limb perspective as well um, so yeah you know we, we we're absolutely looking at the profile of those individuals of being able to do that and the jobs that they do in those geographical areas in and around the low block um, one of, one of the, the, the questions from me, um, Tom, a couple of things just around those statistics would be how many of those um, assists and goals have come when you were kind of set in a low block or transitionally working back towards your own goal? Yeah. And the second one would be around um, um, if if you look at the areas that they're, they're coming from, would you practice that 
but in linking to Jimmy's point around the session design, would you practice that in isolation or would you practice that in a whole half with all of the players kind of in that, if that makes sense? Or would you work in lanes one and five around individual stopping supply or would you put all of that together in a session? Quite a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll give um, one, Tom, but I'll, I'll leave it for a minute. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no problem. I think we, we, we'd be like you, John. We, we are, you know, having looked at this stuff, um, it, it, it gets you thinking, doesn't it, about what attributes the players need to have in order to be successful at international level. So, uh, as you've rightly, um, have you, as you rightly said, one of the things I guess, and an easy thing to think about is, is, is our, you know, what, what sort are they any good in the air? What, what are they like heading and judging the flight of the ball? So. A lot, most of the most of the chances have come from from their feet, but a lot of those, um, sorry, a lot, of, a lot of the chances have come from opposition kicking the ball in, or you know, or, or shooting, and only one has come from a headed opportunity. But maybe though, well, certainly those chances have come from our players not being um, fantastic at judging the flight of the ball, um, you know, going underneath the ball, or or or, or, or sort of. Um, missing the ball, um, misjudging it, and I guess, I guess that's one of the things that, that that I think the players need to continually work on. So your point about well, well, do we do we take them away and work in isolation on say this this particular portion of the game, the the way that they judge the fight of the ball and the way they head it, or do they do they do they have the opportunity to practice as a group in eleven aside games and you know on whole pitches or two thirds of the pitch? I, I, I would say both. So. Um, I mean, there's there's, inter there's always interesting discussion about um, whether or not we should be um, doing IDP work with the players and working on, uh, you know, working on things that they need to get better as individuals. I guess my view would be that um, my job as a coach would be to help the players practice the sorts of things that they're going to encounter during the game. So an example of that to sort of um, hopefully answer one of your questions, one of your questions um, when we play Spain, for instance, um, we play with a diamond. We play with a diamond all the way through the all the way through the season. We've decided to play with a diamond, really to suit the strengths of the players we've got in the group. So we haven't got any 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 wingers in the group. We decided we haven't got any wingers in the group. Um, we've got a, an abundance of central midfield players, and we've got a lot a lot of strikers. So we've decided to play with a diamond throughout. Um, we've played Spain twice now, and they play with a, a sort of four three three system. Um, they play in a very sort of controlled way. Uh, they try and play through the thirds. As you can see, they try and score a lot of their goals from passes within the box, from, from box passes or from, from, from cutback crosses. Um, so that's the way they play. They also try and empty the, um, empty the centre of the pitch. So their advanced midfield players or their tens, they play a 4-3-3 system. Their tens empty the middle of the pitch and, and actually play uh, more on the flank. So we've got a lot of players in the middle. They've got a lot of players on the outside. So one of the one of the issues that we thought we would have prior to the game against Spain, having seen them, um, was that we that our centre backs, our defenders, uh, our centre backs and our full backs would have to deal with what we call a box cross. So um, they've got some excellent wingers um, that carry the ball really, really well. We've got some really good full backs who are good one v one. So what we anticipated happen, happening was. The the uh, the winger would 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 turn out and pass back to the fullback or pass back to one of the tens that had vacated the middle of the pitch, and then we would have to defend the next cross or a box cross. Is everyone sort of with me? Yeah, yeah. So the practice that we that that we did with the um, the, the, the centre backs was um, was really about judging the flight of the ball and and, and a little bit about the detail of their position. Um, so uh, we, we set up sort of small unopposed practices to start off with, sometimes at the beginning of the sessions, sometimes at the end of the sessions, where um, the defenders would have to go from helping out, I suppose the fullback would have to go out, for, would go from um, defending 1v1 against a, uh, against a winger. The centre-half, therefore, would have to drop into the box to anticipate a cross coming in. The ball then gets set back to a 10 or to a fullback, and then the ball's delivered into the box. Yeah, and we saw Spain scoring a lot of goals like like that off box crosses. Um, Man City, for instance, a great, a great example. De Bruyne puts a lo loads of high quality box crosses in for Aguero to score. 
uh, in exactly the same way. And we we we, we noticed early on, um, I suppose, yeah, we, we'd identified that one of the things our centre backs needed to get better at was judging the flight of the ball. So um, it, the, the first couple of times we did we, we did this practice, and the two, two centre backs, as the ball went back to the full back, they were stepping towards the towards the full back. Uh, looking at the ball and the and the centre back and sorry and the centre forward sort of pulled off the the the, the centre half and he ended up get, getting in a number of times. So we did a lot of work on, I suppose, the detail of defending that particular ball. Um, and I've got to be honest, I think I think at times sometimes we can neglect um, the, the the technical detail and the coaching we need to give to players. Yeah. Um, so we, we work really hard on, I suppose, on on the detail of that. So the angle of the the, the, the centre half's um, uh, shoulders. So where where would he put his shoulders? Where would he step? And how quickly would he step as the ball went back? How would he judge the flight of the ball? So what's what would the process be in terms of him getting into line with the ball? An in swinging ball, say, as the ball came in from a left hand side. So so where would he drop to first? What foot would he jump off? How he would jump towards, uh, sorry, jump towards the ball. How he'd hang it, hang in the air. Where he would head the ball to. So I think there was a lot of detail um, that, that 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 we found ourselves giving to to, to the centre backs um, in this particular in this particular scenario. Now I don't I don't really see that as an IDP. I, I see that as helping him be better at football in this in that particular context. Yeah. Um, so we do a lot of work out of possession, and then clear, clear we, we try and create some, some situations in the uh, in, in the eleven side practices where we, they'd have to do that as well. Um, I suppose the out. Sorry, just to finish off, I suppose the the unopposed practice is just ensuring they get lo lots of repetition. You know, um, th that would be I suppose a rationale for that unopposed practice, just to give them a bit of repetition and develop a little bit of consequence. And perhaps start to piece together what you know what this particular situation might look like in the in the eleven side game. Sorry, sorry, mate. Um, great. Uh, I suppose the the varied teams and and styles that you're playing against now, and you're coming up against, and you just talked about Spain there um, playing in a certain way. What other what other um, problems have teams come up, uh, thrown at you? Um, over the probably the last 12, 18 months, which has really made you think about this, particularly when you're in the block. So, yeah. uh, so for example, I'm, I'm just looking at the the diagram in front of us here. And, uh, you know, our, our team's looking to deliver the ball early so you don't get yourself set. So obviously you have a lot of, lot of possession of the ball you get back into 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 a block mm. but you might not get set early so so what 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 other problems are, are teams going at you at the minute which you've had to consider in terms of game plan yeah I, I guess i guess like like we've already said different teams um well, i'm just gonna go back Dif different teams seem to seem to throw well, well we'll throw different challenges at you so the the, the spain one um with the the control Progressive sort of possession, um, trying to attack us down the flanks. Um, you know the, the nature of the, the the profile of the players they've got. Very yeah. good ball carriers, very good dribblers, yeah. uh, very good technically, and that that provides one challenge for us. Um, but also, I, I guess playing against um, uh, an Ireland or a Scotland where we're expected to to dominate possession. Um, the nature of the, um, the the threat is different. So John mentioned before about the the transitional threat or the, yeah. that, that that sort of that sort of threat where the you know the centre halves are often pulled into sort of wide areas because our yeah. fullbacks have, have have disappeared up the pitch and we are getting hit on the transition. So yeah. I, I guess in it, as we're building towards the the, uh, the 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 time where our team is is expected to qualify for the European Championships, we are going to face, as John's team will face, and as you know, as footballers face all the time, a variety of different a different styles and a variety of different challenges. So I suppose at this stage in the in in our development of staff and the players' developments as, as international footballers, we're trying to provide them with a number of different experiences. Yeah, uh, and every time we're trying to win the game, you know, we're trying to win the game every single time. But we, you know, we may have to defend slightly differently, and we may have to attack slightly differently, dependent on the on, on the nature of the opposition. 
and that's um that that's a sometimes that's a bit of the beauty of the conundrum that we face as as um coaches is that you know very quickly within a tournament you're going to be facing you know very different styles of play and it's, there's probably a little bit more disparity in you know our category of opponents or a category a opposition is going to be a category a opposition category b category c you know there's more disparity between probably you know we're we're classed as a category a opponent in europe under 17s in the ydp and playing a category c opponent is is there's quite a gap but it pre presents different problems for us so we try to layer a, uh, and this is the balance of development versus competition and trying to win stuff we try to layer things where for example um we, we know eventually that if we're playing in phase one of europe in september we're probably going to play against at least two deep block teams who are playing in um you know very low blocks and we're going to have to try and face that whereas you play maybe one team or you certainly when you're playing the elite rounds you're going to play two three teams that are going to be fast break teams that will play on transition and be very very competent at it um, and we're we're going to have to you know in transition be able to deal with running back towards our own goal or when we get there we're going to have to deal with sustained attacks so we try and provide a curriculum of development over 15 16 and 17 so that when they get there they have the skill set and the tools to being able to to deal with those um a variety of opponents yeah well, so it's, it's a great point good 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 point. Um, yeah, so I'll just I'll just continue sort of going through this this, this stuff. I mean, it, 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 uh, again, in terms of the goals, I try, I try to have a have a, a very sort of broad view of where the goals are coming from. So as you can see, most of the goals are coming from that we're conceding are coming from from crosses, whether that's outside the box, whether that's inside the box, and clearly that 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 may well be, be dependent on the style of opposition we're playing against. Um, one goal came from a defensive turnover where we passed it to the opposition and they they managed to score. So we're trying we're trying to rule that one out uh, as, as we move forward. <laughs> and, and one of the goals came from a, a pass inside the box that was um, that was against the United States. And then one goal, as we talked about, came from came from a direct ball. So I think what what I was trying to do with this stuff is try and like, like I said, not to figure out where the goals are coming from, but then link it to the sorts of things that we need to. Um, or the players need to be to, to be good at in order to defend these goals. So something really, really similar um, for, for, for clear cut chances. So I combined the clear cut chances we conceded with the with the goals we've conceded. So the A, as I said before, with a with a yellow, the yellow A is, a, is it went to a goal, and the A with a with a with a white A, sorry, the, the green dot there with a white A, that's that's an assist for a clear cut chance, a clear cut chance. So I guess that sort of tells a similar sort of story in terms of the nature of the the nature of the uh, uh, of the chances and the goals conceded against different opposition. I suppose the one difference there is the the light blue here is is uh, the chances that we conceded against um, against Japan. Um, so two from a, a sort of a deepish, widest position, and then one from a central position. So. As John John will know, Japan are very uh, are very strong internationally in the in the age group teams. They they play with a, a lot of energy. Um, they are a, a high pressing team um, that are technically very good. They play a four four two system that that has historically caused us a number of problems. Um, they play with uh, they play with uh, yeah four four two system. So the the two midfield players. Um, uh, Often full of energy, they get the ball into wide areas and try and score from a whole host of different uh, of, of different areas of the pitch. Uh, they can hurt you from wide, they can hurt you from central. Uh, we managed to see them off on this occasion, but again, sort of interesting to see where those two uh, where those two uh, chances came from and, and and how that links to to, to the style of the opposition. Tom, it's interesting looking at that graphic there. Then, you know, if you're talking about a low block, I think if if we we talk about a low block and I took it to the people on the course and in their clubs. What yeah. does a low block look like? We're always looking. We're always, I think sometimes we, we get into the, the sink that we need to be set. We're always going to be set and you're not yeah. always going to be set to be low blocking. You know, That's so right, if yeah. I look at some of those around the goal and outside of the goal, in particular, what you just said about Japan, you know, what does a low block really look like there? And in the context of the people that's on the course, what does a yeah. what does a low block look like there? Is it is it a low block, or do we go into the next bit of that low block of emergency defending? 
Yeah, well, I mean, our teams, as, as, as John, we'll, we'll try and dominate possession. So the, the majority of the time, um, not the majority of the time, but as a general principle, our team, our teams will try and have more of the ball than the opposition, and that generally sort of turns out to be true. So if you look at our stats throughout the season, that that is true. We've, we've, we've dominated possession against every team, that's including Spain. Um, so often we're in possession high up the pitch, um, and the chances that the opposition get uh, potentially can be from from turnover. So yeah. um, you know, our, our fullbacks. I'll, I'll come to the way that we try and counter that. The, the, you know, the way that this the threat of the counter attack as we go through the presentation. But but you're right. Sometimes we're conceding chances on on, on what I call the stretch. Yeah. So the, the the chance the chance there in the. Uh, on the left flank for Ireland, I can remember that one distinctly. That's that's a full one of our full backs getting caught high up the pitch. Um, the, the, we've given the ball away, or, we, or the opposition have made a, a, a tackle. We're chasing back there um, as as a left uh, as a left winger uh, progresses up the pitch. He slings across into the box. We misjudge the flight of the ball, and they they tap it in at the far post. So that that was sort of the nature of of, of of the goal, that particular goal, that particular chance. So what that says to me about the players that we need to have in our team is that we need to be ready for this. You know, we need to be ready for this threat. So the centre halves, the, the, the defenders, they need to be good at judging those sort of long balls into the box. They also need to be comfortable, as John's already pointed out. The central defenders often have to be comfortable defending in in, in a sort of wide area because often. That's where they end up defending one v one. Would that be similar for you, John? Yeah. So, um, whereas you know the, the trends in the game, uh, you know, couple, a decade and a half ago, 10, 15 years ago, was around flexible forwards, etc. You know, now we're we're seeing you have to be flexible as defenders as well, in that you might have to do uh, multiple dual roles, whether that's a holding midfielder. You know, stepping and dropping into a back line, um, whether it's a fullback that has to work inside in rotation. Um, because a central defender has moved outside, you know, there, there, there's a recognition around that. And um, to, to Jimmy's point is that, you know, we have to prepare players for transitionally moving into a low block. And that will be done with sometimes numerical supremacy. Sometimes it will be disorganised. Sometimes it will be where the ball's gone flanked. Sometimes it will be where the ball's gone central. What are you going to do when they, you then got into your block and you set um, and you're dealing with the first um, wave of the attack and then sustained waves of attack the ball comes in it goes back out again so there is an absolute plethora of things that we have to provide the, we have to upskill the players to be able to do um, yeah. I guess one of the key things is is using building blocks to doing that so the first principle whether it's transitioning into a low block being in a low block or um, sustaining in a low block is about you know prioritizing the central area first and making sure you look at where the um, assists are coming from but actually look at where the goals are scored um, they 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 work they they correlate but actually the priority piece is dealing with the central area first and then if you can deal with the sustained or the assist and everything else from that as a platform so yeah there, there's even though there are multiple you know the game's endless in terms of the problems it will present players it's being able to get some building blocks in place that enable the players no matter the scenario they can try to deal with it so yeah thanks John I think that's been you know you've, you've explained that really well and I, again, I'm just just in my mind looking at it from a you know a learner's point of view on the course, and I think sometimes we, get, we we've all and I've been guilty of it in my time as a coach. You get guilty of set, setting everything up so it's equal equal and even. Mm, um, yeah. And like you've just yeah. said there, John, you, you, there's a number of practice designs you can do in transition, in in possession, out of possession. You know that would lead into a low block eventually happening. Your recovery runs, for instance, what do they look like? How, how are they done? Where are they done from? Where, where are they done to? All those type of things. And I think, you know, the learners, when they're, when they're looking at that, how can they challenge their players in the best way yeah. possible to give them, and, and, and I wrote it down earlier, John, ironically, I call it flexible adaptability yeah. within, within your players. How can you give them flexible adaptability to be able to, to, to see the thing and, and react to it really quickly? Jim, Jim, I just add to that then. So, uh, and I think that they've both TC and uh, John have been brilliant at this. They've they've sort of had a rationale for around uh, their thinking, and then it's about that repetition and ensuring that you've got realism within your practice. Uh, yeah. Because you've got to create these. You've got to create this. If you don't create this 
as as um, the problems that the players are going to going to um, experience, then uh, you can't blame the players if um, on on match day kind of thing. So really important. It's really you know again what you just said there, Jim. Really important the learners pick that up. You know, you, you keep rationale, uh, realism, and repetition when, when you're thinking about your practice. And yeah, and the, go on, sorry, go. it's scaffold in the practice as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you can you we are, we don't you know I I probably use as least amount of cones or equipment as I've ever used now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I try and make sure that the reference points, as feasibly possible, are the markings that are on the the, the pitch. Yeah. So the players yeah. they're operating within realism of reference, but realism within the practice, and then scaffold it. So you might, you know, uh, you know, as a as was a um, a functional practice, you may have central defenders dealing with aerial threats centrally or sustained from wide or whatever that may be, but then yeah. bolt the other pieces around it as well. Yeah. So scaffolding the 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 work for the individuals is important, but then also, um, you know, giving them the the what's realistic and making sense of the game so yeah. you know doing a lot of stuff in and around the ball but actually loads of stuff away from the ball that's where we get mostly undone in a low block defensively is actually the, the ball's on one side in lane five and the fullbacks got into a beautiful position of you know cover and balance etc cetera, etc cetera. but then because of their stage of development they're actually caught completely ball watching and looking at the ball yeah. on the opposite side yeah. and don't see the player off the off yeah. the opposite flank cutting yeah. in so yeah. so we work heavily a lot on those trigger skills where for example the, the ball comes in supply from lane one and the yeah. player is actually in a position where the body's facing almost completely the opposite way almost like basketball would be around a key and they're actually yeah. watching a player in lane five more than they're watching the ball so yeah. it's not just about the you know the football stuff it's about also them being able to make sense of the game around them with with some relevance yeah, yeah. Well, i guess I Go on, sorry, Jim. Sorry, Tom. Um, I no think problem. it's a great point, John. And, and y y if you took if you took the thing that you've just explained and said to someone, put on a practice design using four players. Mm -hmm. One is one is your right back. One is your left back. And and you know it'd be really interesting to see what they come up with because what you've just said there is absolutely spot on. The amount of times that players end up getting, and I would actually say senior players as well, yeah. do this get caught ball watching. You know they're not scanning enough. They're not. They're not. What, however you want to call it, scanning perception, all that kind of thing. And then straight away, before you know it, that 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 girl or boys run off the inside of them, and and, and they're in on goal. So I think that, Jim, it's that it's that awareness, isn't it? And about <laughs> about reading the game as well. So as John said about the eyes, the head, the feet, the body, and and I know Absolutely. you highlighted that before. And and. Do we do enough of those anticipation skills? You know that mental agility that's required. You know, do, do we do enough of that um, with our players? And and um, obviously the two guys are talking about this, and this is how they how they work. But you know, those are the key things that that go into the makeup of good defending. And, and you know, I go to Tom's point earlier around how much do we do with the technicity of that, and and none of it sits in isolation. So whereas right. you know watching a player on the outside is a a decision making thing it's actually a, a physical thing as well because what you have to do is is face your body in the right way angle it to the right um so you can process where the ball supply is coming from and where the the player may be but also yeah. it's a physical it's, a, it's an actual physical action in moving your head it's not a decision making yeah. piece you have yeah. to move your head from left to right um, and you have to practice physically doing that so yeah. it's about giving them the detail that helps them get better technically physically and practicing it and hopefully developing communication skills as well at the same time. So, um, yeah, Tom, you were going to think. Yeah, no, I think what what I suppose what in terms of a broad focus for for, for this, uh, for, for me looking at the way that we've conceded these goals and we've conceded these chances, is to as John says, try and make the the, the practices that we deliver as realistic as possible. Mm -hmm. So when we when we're delivering a you know a defending pro uh, practice. Um, three days before the game, are we addressing the, the, the things that the players are going to encounter during the game? So yeah. if we are playing against Ireland, are we doing, you know, are, are we getting the, the centre-backs to be dealing with, with, with sort of long, longer crosses? Are we um, practising concentration? Because I think that's an important one as well, you know. So so we, we've we already mentioned that, that sometimes we, we play against opposition where we dominate possession and then the defensive actions don't happen that frequently. So are we giving 
the players a chance sometimes to practice, you know, doing nothing for a period of time. You know, the, the, these are the sorts of things that I'm thinking about now as a coach. And, you know, every time I put something on, I'm thinking, well, is it real? Is it worthwhile? Because I think that's a really a critical consideration for us as national coaches because we don't have the players that long. Yeah. So, um, that, you know, we... Tom, we I, um, I just... Sorry, I just want to. Can I pick up on that one as well? I was just going to say to you and John. Yeah, yeah, as well, sure, yeah. That, mm. You know, you uh, your camps are ten days, nine days, ten days, three. Some of them, three. Some yeah, of them. it depends. Okay, it, so it depends, but, but I'm, I'm looking at that there, and I'm I'm sort of judging you as a against a coach who's in a club four or five times a week, where you, the practice design that you're doing, with the greatest respect to you both, probably needs to be nigh on spot on every time. Because you yeah. don't get enough time, enough days to refine it. You yeah. can refine it, but it's going to be six or eight weeks later when you see the girls and boys again uh, at the next camp. But then you're moving on for a different set of games, different tournament, etc. So you're, you know, for the, for the learners out there, I think when you're in club, you're lucky because you can refine your practices and you can go back and you can look at it again within the international tournament stuff that you guys do. Yeah, you will be able to refine it, but your your time your your time allowing you to do that with the same group of players is a lot less than what you get in club. Yeah, Jim, we had we had this conversation yesterday, didn't we, about uh, about the context that we're we're operating in. Yeah, uh, I guess like you like you you pointed out yesterday, our, our context or the context with with the with, with our team is is significantly different to, to to those in the clubs. So we may well have a a three day lead in time to a. Uh, to a tournament and we might then play game rest game rest game and then go go home yeah. so, so so the context is is different I guess um you're right in terms of the practice we we don't have an opportunity to to, to, to evolve and change and you know and, and sort of tinker with the practices over a you know a two six eight week sort of period we need to make sure the practices are going to going to be uh, spot on at, like I said before, addressing the problems that the, the players may encounter during the game. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I'd say was, was, you know, again, we had the conversation yesterday around sort of um, uh, structure, the, 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 uh, a sort of structured versus a, a slightly less structured sort of approach. Yeah. I think what we found moving forward, going through this season, is that because we have a number of players coming in from lots and lots of different clubs, playing lots and lots of different systems, um, lots and lots of different philosophies, lots and lots of different coaches. Our job is to a win win the games we're involved in, um, but also so 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 if if, that, if that's the case, then then we need to provide some real sort of clear um, a clear focus and provide some real clarity on what people's jobs are. So we play a system which you know a, a lot of the players haven't played at their clubs mm. so I, I think it's therefore really important that that we're really clear on the messages we're giving giving the players those messages are clear they're consistent they have a, a degree of clarity and um, what we do with that is we, we we tell them the same things in lots and lots of different ways so you've already you've already said the practice needs to be absolutely spot on yeah. It needs to be right. We don't have the time to, to, to mess about. It needs to be spot on. Um, we'll then go um, in, into the classroom and we, we, we might review. Uh, well, we would review. We review, re review the, um, the, the practice. Now, we might review the practice in a different way. So we might review that one-to-one. -one. We might review that in small groups. We might review that in a big group. We might review in different ways. We might get the players to look at it themselves. There might be some instruction by the coach. But the messages are simple and, and, and they're, they're, they're the same. So we tell the players, you know, we give the players as much clarity as we can. We make it as concise as we can, and we tell, continue to tell them in different ways. We might then go onto the Sabutio board and tell them the same thing on the Sabutio board. I might then um, go and speak to a player as we're walking down to the to, to the to the change room with the group and give them the same sort of message. So that's certainly something that I've learned, and 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 you know, over the past sort of four or five years doing this job is. You, I, I don't think you can shy away from 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 giving. Um, you know, structure to the players. That doesn't mean to say they're robots when they go out on the pitch. But by, 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 by the way, but, but but I think some some clear structure and a clear idea on what our expectations are from those individual players. I don't know what your 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 take on that, John. Is your context might be slightly different. I don't know. No, it's exactly the same. And um, we 
uh, yeah, I agree with you, Tom. We we don't get the opportunity where you're working in a club and you've got three, four sessions a week. It's ideal you can practice something or you can, you know, as a, as a coach, not just the players. So we have to find yeah. ways of being inventive as a, as coaches where, you know, we might not see the players for six weeks. So when they come back, we've got to be nailed on. Now, as a coach, you know, you know what it's like as a player. If you don't play for six weeks, it becomes a challenge to pick straight away back up to the pace of the game, the tempo of the learning. It's the same for the coaches. You know, going six weeks without having been on the grass is a challenge. So we have to be inventive around ways that we go away, practice things. So when we come back, the because the idea for us is, like you, Tom, is that we have to accelerate the players' learning over a very, very short piece of time. However, the advantage we do have is that we have the players for 24 hours a day. And what we the, by the ways in which we can dice and slice that up to the players' advantage, whilst considering load, whilst considering how often the players are in contact with us, they get enough white space in the program to have some t- time for themselves, etc., is really important. And I think the other thing for us is that the, the the gone are the days of the coach being the font of all knowledge and having to be there all the time. So the plan, do, review processes that we have, we're actually planning for the review. But I, I you know, it's really important that, um, you know, we, we're the similar as you, Tom, is that we have to do it from a framework. So just not going to the players, right, go away and review that. It's asking them what they're reviewing, why they're reviewing it, and what we want them to present back as a result of that review. So everything we do has a framework to it. But at sometimes we put a crutch in and the coach supports it. At other times, the players need to experience it. At other times, the players need to review and reflect against it and then present something back and have a go again. Um, the other thing is is that how how many players we work with. So we'll stagger times within the sessions. We'll work with four players for 10 minutes before the rest of the players come out. And then that learning is then chunked into the main body of the session. So it's being smart and clever in your coaching, not just going, right, we've got to have all the players doing all the same stuff all the time, is giving little bite sites of information, but then that they transfer it and apply it in context as part of sessions. But, you know, we only get an hour and a half, two hours sometimes, if if we're lucky, depending on what game day it is and what loading it is, um, to work with the players. So giving them little triggers, little clues, little cues all the time. And you're absolutely spot on, TC, is that, you know, making sure that we give them a small amount and it's done loads and loads of times just in similar ways is really important. That's good. Uh, that's Good, and I, and I suppose like that process of making sure that uh, that the practices are right and appropriate for the challenges and the players may encounter during the game has sort of uh, has sort of steered my thinking in terms of I think he's gone off, lads, hasn't he? Yeah, I think we lost him. <laughs> Mind you, mine, mine keeps dipping in and out as well, by the way. Yeah, I think what he's going to do now is talk about this low block defending. These are where he wants to work. Yeah. With with the the, the what he's come up with in terms of the stuff yeah. on the yellow side of it, Bish, which yeah. we talked about yesterday. Yes, they didn't uh, Yeah, so we just... And I think it, um, that's, that's where you start. We were talking about it earlier on, about the um, technical skills you know the technical requirements you know as scanning body position feet um you know we'll it, 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 the other thing so you look on the top line the three sort of pillars that that yeah. are the blocks to the rest of it that sits beneath it you know they're they're really um you know pressing pressing isn't chasing pressing is an absolute planned um you know coordinated um military like uh, ability to being able to you might not you know you put pressure on the first ball it might not be the first individual that wins it, it might be the second one but the pressure's in place to apply on the second individual within the unit to, to provide right. the compactness to be able to regain but then that relies on things like the the 1v1 excellence um, and and how good physically are our players to be able to deal with the 1v1 excellence yeah. and again can make the the right physical action that links to the cognitive decision that they're making when an individual's in front of them you know they 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 do a lot of the time when they go you know yeah but i was watching the ball with a player but it's not just about the ball the clues are in the actual individual physically if you actually watch the hips they'll tell you what they're going to do with the ball next but you then you have to watch what the ball's doing because potentially you might be able to get a block or a regain or a um a, 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 an action where you can pinch and steal the ball um, and it's giving that real physical technical detail again to those individuals and again it's different central to it is wide yeah so yeah. 
in terms of John, in terms of the the the, the women and girls program now, um, how important would you say this is for you now? The, the you know we just talked about one v one excellence, uh, of implementing that within the um, the curriculum um, with the player it, it, development and, and 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 the focus of coaches because obviously. If we can impact it there, back it back in clubs, then it's going to have a you know you're, you're going to have better players to work with, with with these skills that you can hone. It's it's crucial. Uh, it's absolutely vital. You know, we we conceded um, two goals to Germany, which prevented us in the semi final of the Euros in 2016, prevented us from going on and um, and and going to the final with you know probably one of our um, highest potential groups that we'd we'd had, and both goals came from. Um, individual defending in and around the penalty area. You know, those those goals are very few and, and easily preventable, in my opinion, because if you just get your feet right, if you just get your position right in between the ball and the goal, actually, if you don't commit and you just remain in that position, the, the pressure's on the, the, um, the, the forward to try and do something to moving you. And then it's little things like just being being brave in and around those areas when they're taking shots from range or shots from close is physically making sure that you're in a position whereby you can be a big enough barrier to affect the shot. Um, you look at a lot of TC stats in there and you're talking more so when you're probably in a, a low block position and yeah. you're having to defend then those sustained shots. But, you know, we talk to our players a lot about actually you're a goalkeeper that can't use your hands. The goalkeeper invariably as a last line of defence wouldn't turn their shoulders um, and show them their their number on the back of their shirt when a shot was coming in. So why is that acceptable for a central defender or a midfielder to do that in a central area when actually the same as the goalkeeper, you just can't use your hands. So similarly, don't turn your shoulders and show them the number. You know, yes, it, you know, sometimes it does hurt in those areas, but that's your job from that position. And, and those are the sort of excellent skills and, and again, they, if you link, listen to them, they're all in, in all four corners. You know, the bravery piece comes from a psychological piece. You know, the physical piece of not getting in the habit of turning your shoulders or making sure that your feet are set in the right position and your shoulders are square, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're from all of the four corners. Well, having that, I suppose, having that mentality of not to be beaten, not the, you know that one v one, you're going to come out on top. You're not going to get beaten. And, and Fish, it, I think, I think. Oh, sorry, Tom. Sorry, so yeah, Bish, yeah, just to just ju just to sort of jump in on that one. You know, you, you're talking about blocks and the importance of that. Um, that that certainly that, that you know, the, the, looking at where the goals come from again, that's certain and where they scored from again. That that is a crit it's a critical skill for defenders. Uh, and like John says, it's it, you know blocking. Uh, I think if we're working in American football, you would have a specialist coach coaching you how to block. You know what yeah. your 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 body position should be, how you you distribute the weight in your feet, wh where you look, where you put your hands, um, how to mirror the movement of the opposition. Do you look at the ball? Do you look at the hands? Do you look at the head? Do you look at the feet? Th these are really uh, technical things that I've found myself, and I guess you have as well, John, sort of coaching the players. And, and these are critical skills that the, that the players are going to need to have if they're going to defend effectively. Yeah. And, and you look at, you know, the game's won so, and lost in, in kind of both boxes. And we have specialist yeah. goalkeeping coaches um, and they won't thank me for this. Course, yeah. How many times do we have a specialist, you know, central defending element or a specialist forward scoring goals mm -hmm. element? Because, you know, that that's penultimately yeah. that they're, they're only one individual as a, as a you know, a, a team of 11 people on the pitch. And there are just as many specialisms that we probably don't pay enough attention to these days as yeah. as as the goalkeeper, as there should be, you know, central defenders, forwards, etc. So so the slide the slide there, that that the, the stuff in it's a bit wordy, but the stuff in uh, the stuff in yellow is the stuff I'd like to to talk about in the next sort of 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe talk a little bit about how that is um, you know, how 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 we've coached that and how that sort of fits into our tactical approach. So as you can see at the top, you know, the, the, the out of possession um, principles for England teams are sort of 1v1 excellence, compact team shape, and, and we're a pressing front forward, front foot team. The ideas that we've found ourselves coaching the, the players or the detail that sits underneath that is all the writing underneath. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about and, and get, get your sort of contributions on, on the idea of blocking inside the width of the goal and this idea of defending across you know, um, how that changes when it's a, a cross from distance, how that changes when it's a, a sort of box cross. This concept of defending while we attack and shutting down the counter-attack, we've all already sort of started to think about that. 
and then the importance of what I call faced up duels. Um, often you you know some people call that one v one defending, but how how you defending one v one is affected by by another player sort of quite close to you, whether that's opposition or or one of your own players. So is is that okay? Is everyone comfortable with that? Yeah. So to, We lost Tom again. I mean, for us, we we would do exactly the same sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and we would use some of them as building blocks. So, for example, you know, and um, doesn't matter whether you're in transition, moving into a low block, doesn't matter whether you're defending, you know, aerial threats, sustained attacks from wide, or you know, dribble drivers. Essentially, you know, blocking off that that central width of the goal area is absolutely paramount. And and getting players and and because we deal with young players, you know, they are. Um, that they they can be a bit keen at times, and what they want to do is go flying out to the ball in a variety of different areas, positions, etc. Um, so it's it's making sure that they understand the priority of those principles first, and can work from those as a as a kind of a platform. Yeah. So shall I shall I cut shall I cut in there? Can you hear me yeah. again? Yeah. 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 So I, I guess to in order to sort of do what we said we were going to do and look at those those sort of four coaching ideas, I'm going to give you a bit of an idea about how we how we go about sort of deploying the players in different areas of the pitch. We play, like I said, we play with a diamond, um, but our diamond is, 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 is John's, as John's John's systems will be, and the systems you played in Jim and, and Bish will be, will be flexible. Um, so th th that gives you a bit of an, an idea about how we would deploy our players high up the pitch when they got, when the opposition have a goal, a goal kick. So we, we, we call that sort of our stopping, starting and position. So um, we, we you know, we have two forwards, so we, we call them the nines. We have a, a number 10 that plays in the pocket. We have a side diamond, side diamond and a pivot. So what I talk about there is, 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 is the players playing in between positions. It's a sort of set position um, that enables us to press when the ball goes either to the five, the three, um, the, 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 their midfield players or their strikers. So that, that's the sort of the way we, we sort of deploy the players in that area of the pitch is everyone is everyone sort of with me on that yeah, yeah. gives you a bit of an idea um when we're in a in a mid block actually we found ourselves in, in the diamond never really being in a, in the type of position in the middle of the pitch where we are you know sliding or screening for a you know when i, when I played i was you know i never had a touch of the ball so i was always in midfield and i can remember the, the, the coach saying you've got to slide and you've got to screen and you've got to be patient and not press We've sort of found ourselves always being in a sort of start, what we call a starting pressing position. So we'll be in a sort of four, three, one, two sort of formation. Whenever the ball moves to the side of the pitch, that will be a trigger for us to press. So for the majority of the time, um, well, again, depending on the position of the fullback, the side of the diamond in this in this um, in this picture, he goes out and presses the fullback. Yeah, our ten will then go and do what we call the near side pivot. Our pivot and the opposite side diamond will slide across to protect the middle of the pitch. The fullback and the two centre halves um, are ready to defend either in front or behind, and the opposite fullbacks round to cover. And our, our nine, so our nine, one of the nine's job would be to stop the ball back to centre back, and the other nine's job would be to sort of drop in and try and get around the uh, the, the, the second pivot and protect so the switch. Yeah. Tom, so once the ball goes out that area, the idea is to keep it out there. Yeah. Yeah, we press aside. Yeah, we 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 we're, clear, we're vulnerable on the switch. So because yeah. we play with a sort of narrow midfield and a narrow, uh, a relatively narrow two two strikers, we are vulnerable for, to the switch. So yeah. we get into a sort of middle of the pitch when we can't put pressure on the ball initially. We get ourselves into a four three one sort of two formation. As soon as the ball goes wide, that's a trigger to press. Yeah. Sometimes it's a side diamond. Sometimes it's a nine. Sometimes it's the fullback. But we don't want them to to turn out and, and and try and attack the opposite end of the pitch. So it just gives you a bit of an idea, I guess, on some of the the attributes we want the players to have, as well as the sort of tactical structure we give them. Um, and and we're, we're similar as well, Tom. And what we'll do is, you know, because there's, there has to be an acceptance in the game. You know, we we in my early days internationally, you spend a plethora of time setting up like that, yeah. um, and working for. But a game doesn't work like that. So you you, you almost that becomes your. Um, what what you would prefer to happen as a result of where you may be, but accepting that actually a nine might be a side diamond at some point because of the circumstances in the game. So um, 
principally you operate on the you know we operate on the the value that if the ball's in lane five stop it there keep it there don't allow it back into lanes four if it comes back into four try and get it back into five but yeah. the, the, there's a recognition that um uh, players that are around the ball that are closest to them so if where you got the previous picture that you got the the player in lane um in lane uh five for example so the, the, their fullback's got the ball yeah. is that whoever the closest players are to that get pressure on the ball and get pressure and cut off the players around it yeah. so that it's a, it's a principle so that the players aren't looking around going hang on my job was the five my job was the six yeah. is that actually they know from those positions is when the ball's in lane five get pressure on it and don't let it into four if it comes into four you don't let it into three you push it back into five um, so because circumstantially they just might be in different positions based on what might happen within in a phase of a game yeah, yeah that's good good and then the, the, again just to give you a bit of an idea on a on a i suppose a structure in terms of um defending a cross this is often the sort of the, the sorts of situations we get ourselves in and this is um again this is this is I suppose in many ways one of the weaknesses of our diamond so um, when the ball's in a wide position there we, we would you know potentially ask the fullback to go and stop the cross from the 11. we asked this we asked we'd ask the side diamond to get across and 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 help um the pivot and the opposite side diamond come across and and, and protect the middle of the pitch the 10 tries to get around the pivot um and near side nine will try and stop the stop the uh, stop the switch or be ready for a transitional position and then the opposite nine would um, would would probably recover to the to, to the opposite side of the the, the midfield four. Um, Jim, you, you you we talked yesterday, didn't we? You you might do that slightly. You've done that slightly differently with your teams, haven't you? Yeah. So we we sometimes you know it, obviously we, we we even when we played a diamond, sometimes we we go flat and and the ten would drop in uh, and the pivot, and you'd end up with a flat back four. But equally, if we're playing uh, other ways, when I was at Forest, our we we played like a, a one four three three. Yeah. Our wider our wider forwards, as such, would track back and be expected to double up with the fullbacks. Tom, yeah. Um, and Gary Brazil, the academy manager there, was would be quite insistent that that's the work they've got to do. Yeah. So you know, I know you know young lads and and people like Arvin Apier, Alex Mighton. They would be expected to track back and do that kind of work. Yeah, um, you talking about the, op- the the nine on the opposite side. You mean? Yeah, exactly yeah. that. So yeah. you know, in a way, what we're trying to do, we're trying to teach them them lads that all right, it might be good. We might play one way, but if you go to another club and they, the manager wants you to track back, we want you to have that locker to be able to track back as well, Tom. Yeah. So. Yeah, we um, and and the answer to your question is we definitely have done that a different way. We don't always use a side diamond to go out, um, yeah. and and help help the fullback out. Yeah, so I, I guess a principle for one of the, the 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 bits of structure that I coach the players is is if the wide player um, takes a touch to come inside, he must run into a midfield player. So that's a yeah. that's a non negotiable for me. Um, and in this case, it's the, it's the side diamond. We, we talked yesterday, didn't we, about. Um, the ten sometimes dropping into a sort of central midfield position, yeah. um, and, and you've you've done that. Now we we've decided uh, not to do that really based on the profile of the players we've got in the group. So mm. the the two side diamonds and the pivot are more sort of midfieldy sort of players than the than the guy that's a ten. He's sort of less, I suppose, um, defensively um, responsible than the than the pivot and the two side diamond players that we we generally have in the team. And then the other thing I suppose to mention is the nine on the opposite side. It, it you know it's in a great transitional position there i think i think that's a really uh, great position um to pick up a sort of loose ball so any cross that comes in from the 11 that's sort of headed away by center half or or even fullback i think can drop to the nine and that the profile again of, of, of the nines that we've got in the team they're really excellent ball carriers so again that would i suppose that would be a rationale as to as to the, the structure that we've we've tried to adopt at times in in that sort of low block so, Tom, um, what, what's, really, what's really interesting, you know, coming away from where I did at Forest, and and obviously we we had Martin O'Neill there previous to uh, Sabri Lamucci who came in, and what one of the one of the things that the new gaffer did there, um, Sabri was, he used this saying, "Don't go to goal too quickly." So in that th- this graphic here is a really good one. So if if you if your team were to win it back, he would want the team to keep the ball. Yeah. And he might want them to keep the ball in deeper areas, but be comfortable to do that. 
Yeah. So if you look at the look at the, the word the DNA of, of Nottingham Forest right now, they give up possession a lot of the time in the games. Yeah. They play on they they play on on the back foot, and and they 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 spend a lot of time in that mid to low block, and they they've actually done it quite well. But when when they win it back, he wants them to keep the ball. Is that so it, is that to draw the opposition onto him first to to then? It, what, it is good? it is sometimes exactly that, but it's also to to take more touches of the ball, exactly yeah. to draw to, to to try and get the opposition moving around again. You've always at this moment in time, and it has predominantly been Lewis Grabham from from when I left, and he's been in you know in the team, and he's not had any injuries this year, so it's been in, in this season, so it's been great for the club. Now Lewis is uh, is a good out for them, but equally he wants. Ben Watson on the ball, and he wants you know Dawson on the ball, and he, and he likes he likes the fullbacks Cashy getting forward, but he, he doesn't he doesn't want to get it and go forward too quickly. Although he's got Joe Lolly, he's got he's got pace in the team, but he always he talks about when we used to send some of the young lads down there. Again, I, I mentioned the two Arvin and um, Alex. He, he he'll say he'll come back and the, the 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 stuff that comes back to us into the academy building is that they want to go to goal too quickly and I'd never heard that before but mm. when I listened and, and talked to Bruno, his assistant, he sort of explained what he what he wants and why he wants it and I sort of half get it. So we did a load of work. Literally, this graphic explains a lot of of what we did, Tom, in terms of our practice design, yeah. where we'd actually have an eleven v eleven, but it would be played there in a low block, and when we won the ball back. We would have to keep it. Yeah. We'd have to. We'd have it to a point where we overplayed, and then we would lose it again, and then get back into a low block and overplay, and then next time we might get out. Um, and it really because we always felt with the twenty threes at times <coughs> they 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 were in too much of a hurry, where they didn't need to give it up, and they, we wanted them to stay on the ball longer as well. Yeah, I guess that's a whole a whole um, yeah a whole. Different, different world, isn't it? You know that, that decision about when to when to counter and when to build and how quickly to go and yeah. you know do, do, you know do you do you, do you need it? so if it drops to the nine there, um, do you need another uh, pass to the ten maybe to drag the five a little bit closer to the ten to create some space in behind or is the nine capable of running down the side of the two and then waiting and cutting back to the fullback and you know, there's, there's loads of stuff there isn't it to, to, to think about but I guess that just gives you a bit of an idea on on our structure just and another then, Tom just on there on the, the role of the pivot then yeah. any point would the pivot drop in to the back line um, you know so for example if the centre half is is dragged out uh, wider into a wider position would, would, yeah. would the pivot's job then be to fill that hole uh, I've got some slides actually, Bish. If you hold that thought a little bit, we'll we'll come back to that one. So that'll be that'll be um, that'll be a good one to think about in, in a second. Um, yeah, I was just gonna I was just gonna talk a little bit. Sorry, Bish, to cut to sort of cut you off. We'll definitely come back to that one. But I was just gonna show you a, a little bit about maybe some of the the the, the coaching points um, that we've, we've we've highlighted and some of sort of some of the detail that might hit the, that sit behind that. So. What I've done here is is I've I've created um, uh, a little a little picture that shows maybe you know shows I suppose the deployment of some of our play or the, the way we might deploy some of our players in that sort of low block position when we're defending a, a shot on the edge of the box. Yeah. So um, there's quite a lot of stuff going on here. So um, like we talked about before, I don't think um, that we. I think perhaps we don't coach blocking and maybe as much as as we should. So the, the this is I think this is John Stones here, but it could well be one of our centre backs. Um, I think there's some re real detail behind the way he, he, he's sort of getting into a sort of blocking position and executing that block. So I'm thinking about um, his sort of line of approach, or maybe even before that, as he anticipates that the striker is going to hit the ball towards the goal, he might recover into a position. So that is between the ball and the goal. So that would mean maybe be the first bit of coaching. Then he starts to approach the approach the approach the ball. Um, he, he's probably got to go fast to keep the the the, the 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 striker's head down. How does he position his body? So does he stay uh, really thick? Um, how does he place his feet? So as he you know can he make lots and lots of contacts on the ground so he's able to change direction um, should he need to? 
where does he place his hand hands should he be you know should they be in a natural position should they be up how does he mirror the movement of the of, of the of, of the attacker so i think there's loads and loads of detail there in terms of that particular particular action for the center back and then clearly this the 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 support positions of the other players so i don't know i don't know what you're thinking here jim but I, i'm looking i'm looking at the the opposite center half i'm not quite sure who that guy is i think he's in a de decent enough position there because he's he, he, again he's in he's inside he's in a position where he's sort of in between the ball and the and the goal so he's forming another sort of barrier what yeah. do you think about the position uh, of the fullback there the the the, the, the right fullback for the, 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 i think that's danny rose isn't it i think so I yeah it. Oh, I'm yeah. saying, it, 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 listen, it's it's a chicken and egg, isn't it? Is he too yeah. narrow? Is he possibly too narrow? Because the seven of the opposition, if and he's not going to get slid in by just by the graphic, the lad's having a shot. Mm. But is it is he is he too narrow? I don't think so. Right now, I'd say I'm happy with that. Yeah. Uh, the interesting one for me is is the centre back and and the opposite full back. So I'm assuming I think the centre back here is Harry Maguire. So I, I'd be questioning now um, uh, with. With the learners on the course, I'd be questioning why do you think he's 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 bent down a little bit? Mm. What you know, what what's his body shape telling you? Is it is he bending down so that Jordan Pickford can see it? Is he trying to just is it just a body shape, a natural a natural defending shape that he takes up? He's definitely got his eyes on the ball, and his yeah. feet are shoulder width apart. And I'd say he's just he looks like he's just slightly on that on the hills slightly to turn and go back towards goal should that be a ricochet or yeah should it or, or, or rebound as well i guess like again yeah, in, terms exactly. of the coach, in terms of the coaching there you know he can't be you know his weight can't be on his heels there i, I no. suppose because he's now got to be anticipating what happens if if the goalkeeper saves it and it drops yeah and, um, and that's then like, she defending isn't it you know yeah think mm -hmm. about what might happen next yeah, absolutely, absolutely yeah. Bish. And then the yeah. fullback on the other side, um, Tom. Yeah, I think he's in the wrong position. Yeah, personally, he okay. yeah. it, it, be out inside of the lad. And yeah, um, yeah. traffic here. Sorry, it looks like he's just slightly outside of him. And then mm. is that Henderson? I think that's Henderson, the pivot. Yeah, you know, he could could actually just slide across towards Harry Maguire a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and we don't and we don't know what's happened before this or or after this. So it's not a talk. You know, it's not a. Uh, criticism any of the players but it's just I suppose these are the sorts of things that we as coaches need to look at and, and make some sort of really yeah some some but pertinent I, I, observations on I, I suppose Tom sorry to cut across you yeah no problem mate. we're talking about super fine detail yeah. which we should be as a licensed coach educators and a licensed coaches yeah. these are the things that you not not you and I but you know if that's your team and you're not quite a Gareth Southgate might be totally happy with that. We don't know because we're not in that mm. context. But yeah. if, it, if it's me now looking at that, I'm saying to my back four, if we're a low block, we've got two banks of uh, a bank of four and a bank of three. I'm happy mm. with the way the bank is, but look at let's have a little look at the position of the players. Yeah, yeah, and if and like you said, I mean, if, if clearly the majority of the goals are being scored in and around this area, this is a critical. Uh, skill or a critical attribute for our defenders. So, you know, it is something that we need to pay a lots and lots of attention to because John rightly said these are the moments that can win or, or, or lose your games and cost you tournaments. Absolutely. It's that checklist we were talking about earlier on, isn't it? That scanning ability, the awareness, the reading yeah. the games, the eyes, yeah, and that yeah, yeah. you know, so you, you, you're going back to it again, aren't you? You know, come on, what's happening in front of you? Yeah. yeah. And the other thing... Go on, sorry. Sorry, mate. No, Moving on. That, that, again, Tom, you, you know, Bish... What you said, John said it, you said it, Tom said it. When we ask people, coaches, to when they're coaching players to teach the coach, the, the players to look at the players' eyes, to look at the players' yeah. hips, to look at the players' um, feet, to look well, at their so shoulders. And all the, ball, the, the player with the ball as well, what the player the ball is telling them. You exactly. Know? exactly. The, the player with the ball now is telling me he's going to have a shot. Yes. Without a doubt, he'll be telling all those. Those are their experienced people. But what they've done, and we don't know how quick they do it, they've made observations. Yes. So quickly in their mind, you know, and this is this is the skill of uh, uh, of having experience as you become a a more experienced footballer, a more experienced player, but equally as a more experienced coach, you, you can stand on a touchline and you know what they're going to do as they're receiving the ball. Yeah. No. With you. 
so so that would be you know that would that would be one of the things that we would we we've worked really hard on with the team this year and and especially individuals but also this next one so um we talked didn't we about um the goals coming from or the majority of the goals are coming from crosses whether that's outside the box or inside the box and again i think there's there's lots of detail that sometimes we can um neglect as coaches um so we often get into this 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 sort of position we've 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 talked about how you know we're we're um, for the most part, dominating possession, dominating territory, and the defenders have to be able to defend on the stretch. So I guess this is a, a, a graphic or, or or an image that sort of displays that. So the fullback here has to be, you know, outstanding one v one against this 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 attacker. And there's loads of there's loads of detail I think that often we, we we don't think about and don't talk about. So the stuff I've picked out, and it's not an an, an exhaustible list. Would be um, he looks like he's sideways on and he's showing the the, the winger outside. Um, I think the bit before this. So what what's the angle of his recovery and then approach look like? So he has to get himself into a position before he can then go and approach. And that position invariably, I think, is between the ball and the goal because he comes at the side. Then one touch takes him past. Um, the distance that he is away from the the winger allows. Um, allows other players to get back in so you can see the, the the side diamond getting back in the pivot getting back in the fullback recovering outside if he's too close or too far away then that that doesn't slow the game down so i think the distance he is away from the the the, the attacker here seems to be slowing the slowing the winger down weight evenly distributed with lots of contacts on the floor that enables him to change direction should the should the winger sort of duck inside or duck outside um, yeah, where does he look? I'm not clear on this. I'm not really sure on where where you should look. At, you know, should you should you be looking at the hips? Should you be looking at the legs? Uh, sorry, the feet. Should you looking at, be looking at the eyes? I, I'm not sure. I, I guess that is something that the players will will begin to develop based on uh, who they're playing against. Uh, and then the last thing I always remember Dick Bate talking to me about mirroring the movement of the defender. I think that's really good. So if your foot pattern can sort of um, match the foot pattern of the attacker, that gives you a much better chance to to block across as and when it comes in. So, you know, I've, I've just been talking for five minutes there about a really simple situation. Um, but the, the, I suppose the point is there's loads and loads of detail there for the defender. Um, I guess for us as coaches, our challenge will be how, how we, you know, how we help the players with those sorts of things. Uh, you know, it, it often won't be, you know, it often wouldn't be in a session. You know, I'm not going to stop the fullback in our session when we've got two days before a, a game against Spain and talk to him about all those five things. That, that's certainly not what I'm going to be doing. But I think it's really important that the coaches have that menu of stuff in their head so that they are they are able to, to help the players when it's appropriate. So is this where off-field coaching becomes really important for you, Tisha? Yeah, I think so. I get, again, like everyone's context is everyone's context is different. Um so, so you know, we we've got the players for 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 a, for a decent amount of time um, when they're with us. So we've got them for you know maybe an hour and fifteen minutes on the grass, but we've got them for another sort of twenty three and three quarter hours. Sorry, twenty two and three quarter hours when they're um, when they're not on the grass. So there is an opportunity to do lots and lots of work with them, um, you know, um, off the grass, whether that's video, whether that's animation, whether that's one to one. And I think us for for, for us as a group of staff. Um, for us as a group of staff, that's a really critical part of, 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 of our sort of coaching methodology. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to whip through the, 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 these last two, uh, the, the, these last slides. So again, this is a, this is um, I suppose this is an example of a sort of faced up jewels and the nature of um, uh, the, yeah the, the the fact that it's not just the fullbacks that are dealing one v one in wide areas. So this is this, you can see here the fullbacks um, recovering back into a central position. And the centre backs getting dragged into a wide position to to de to defend one v one. So again, you know, I'm looking at the distance there is between him and the the attacker. You know, if he gets really close or steams right right in, one touch take that one touch takes him past the, the the defender and doesn't allow the rest of the guys to get back in. So the distance here is important. The angle of the approach, the recovery runs are clearly important. You know, we've got the fullback recovering to a central area. We've got the pivot recovering to a to a central area, the side opposite side diamond, the, the, the well both sent side diamonds sprinting back to get to get back in, and the the opposite nine trying to get into a sort of transitional area. So again, I, I guess 
this slide would, would be to, to sort of illustrate a point. It's not just our full backs that need to be excellent 1v1. Clearly, the centre backs and you know all, all the team need to be outstanding at, at, at that sort of stuff. I think that, that this slide shows the the flexibility, the adaptability of your uh, of your players, Tom. <clears throat> really, or, or the players that, that are there, and you know, like you've said already, I think it's important that coaches as well understand that you know, can you give centre backs uh, enough in the locker to go and deal with that, at, you know, in in training and in games. So when it comes to real life, and they're in, in they're in at Wembley Stadium, they're playing in front of ninety thousand people, and the ball gets played down the channel, and the full backs out of position. Are they comfortable going out there? Can they deal with it? Do they get their feet patterns right? Do they slow down quick enough? All yeah. those type of things. Do they not dive in? Do they delay and deny them going forward? You know, what, what are they doing and what, what's everyone else doing behind them in order to, to get back into shape as quick as possible? Yeah. You know, yeah. We, 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 I think one of the most common things used on a touchline is shape or get back into shape. Well, what yeah. does that really look like? Yeah, what's what the detail mean? of it? Yeah, what's the yeah, detail exactly. of it? So where, yeah. where 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 should the fullback be running? Where's the pivot running to? Where's the opposite nine running to? Um, yeah. what, you know, what, what's the position of the the support in centre half? Does he go does he go right the way out of the box and help his, his centre half, or does he stay in the middle of the pitch? This is the detail I think often that we we, we can miss, yeah. uh, and I think just just part of the process about looking at the game, and and you know I think for me you know just putting this stuff together and looking at sort of stills. And trying to rationalise in my head where people should be running, where they are, I think it's a really, a really nice process to sort of enhance your, enhance your learning. Um, yeah, so that's that one. We've we've only got a couple of slides to go. Everyone will be relieved to relieved to hear. <laughs> so again, just to show you a bit, of, a, a bit of structure about how the way you know we've gone about sort of coaching the players to defend defend crosses. Um, we we talk about dropping then marking. So I don't know if you can see there, you know, the, the fullback's obviously getting engaged by the winger, the side diamond's out there to, to help. Um, I would then ask the centre-half to drop initially into a, into a front post zone. Yeah, the other centre-half to drop into a central zone and perhaps the fullback to drop into a far post zone. But, you know, these are only start positions to pick up and track, track runners. I know a lot of people coach this differently. And I think... Um, I think this would, for me, I've started to think about, well, the, the, the intricacies of the way, way you coach this and the way that the players execute this is really dependent on a number of things. So, you know, is it a wide cross? Is it a cutback cross? So a wide cross might give you, as a centre-back, an opportunity to drop into a position and then pick up a runner. If it's a cutback cross, you haven't got the time. So you probably have to pick up a lot quicker. So I think these, you know, the, 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 it's important again. Us as coaches sort of recognise the, that it's not a hard and fast rule. It's not a, it's not a black and white answer. These, this, this would just be, I suppose, a bit of a guide for, a, for, for us defending across from from a sort of wide area. Uh, and then Tom, is this go on. Sorry, mate. Yeah. No, I was, I was going to throw in. I think you're going to jump in here now about the role of the pivot. Yeah. So the cutback area is really important for us. You know, the cutback's really important. So, so the, the, the ten. And the opposite side diamond, really important to get into that cutback area to defend the, 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 the centre part of the pitch. And again, yeah. you know, um, I, I, you know, we talk about that, this idea of dropping, then marking. And, and it's something that's, you know, continually going around in the head. And I need to do lots and lots of lots and lots more work really to sort of really um, iron out the detail. But I think, like I said, it's dependent, you know, whether you pick up quickly or whether you drop into a position and then look to pick up probably will be dependent on who you're playing against and yeah. where the ball's coming in from. Um, pressure on the ball, yeah. Or, yeah, pressure on the ball, all, all, all that sort of thing. So the who you're playing against, you know, you're going to mark Andy Carroll differently than you're going to mark um, Michael Owen. You're just yeah. going to mark them differently. So, um, you know, top-class centre-halves and top-class full-backs are able to work those things out. Hmm. I think I think that it's bang on again, Tom, what you're saying. And, and, they work it out with experience, don't they? And so, you know, how many times have we heard on on a TV commentary, oh, he or she's there again, clearing it away? I think what the top class defenders, the John Terry's of this world, you know, um, the, the, the the best ones, the pure holes, uh, that they learn to sense danger. Yeah. And, yeah. They, and, they, and they just, they, and we talk about realism, relevance, repetition. They've lived it, smelt it, dealt with it every day in training for years and years and years. So any little scenario that comes in that happens. So if this eleven gets past the fullback, 
you know, the, the players I've mentioned will have will have seen that happen a million times. Yeah. So in their in their photographic memory, they'll be going through that so quickly that they'll be, they'll just be able to snuff the danger out. Yeah. Um, and I think that's you know that that's something that we can't give the young kids because it, it takes years of experience. But what you can do is help them understand in terms of what you're doing, give them a structure, Tom, which yeah. you talked about earlier in this this you know this webinar where we can we they can start to learn from that as well. Yeah, and I guess this this slide just gives you a bit of an idea of what that structure might be. Again, I've taken this this um, this situation from a senior game rather than our game, but it does illustrate the same point. So the the, the fullbacks out there to engage the the, the wide play, you can see the two centre halves sort of dropping into the box, and the fullback also dropping into the box. Yeah. I always coach that sort of smiley face shape, so that's the sort of shape I want the the the, the, the back four. To be uh, to be getting into when they're engaging in a sort of wide area, and um, I think body position is really important there, Jim, as well. Yeah. So if you can spin yourself around as a centre half to be able to see the ball and also feel or see your man and anticipate where he's going, and then that's that again, that's a critical thing. The centre forward's trying to see your number. He's trying to get into a position where you as a centre half can't see him, so he can dart across you or pull across or, or pull off your shoulder. So the the more you can do about sort of opening yourself out and alleviating that issue, I think, I think well, the better. Tom, I couldn't agree more. So really, you could have a really, you know, we could have another, another hour with this. Just So that centre-half <laughs> that you're talking about there, where the centre-forward is exactly right. I, as a striker, would have wanted to see that centre-half's number. Yeah. And if I can see that centre-half number, I think I've got him. Yeah. So what is it you tell your centre-half? Do they sprint back to where you want them to defend, then get their shoulders open? I would be asking my centre half to try and get his shoulders open whilst he's running, but is that going to then inhibit his running and all that yeah. type of thing? And then yeah. we go back to the communication bit, which Bish said earlier on. So the second centre half, so the left sided centre half, as we look at it, right, yeah. what's his communication right to the right sided, sorry, the right sided centre half to the left sided centre half? What's his communication like? Because he could be giving him some great instruction as well. Yeah, well, I answer your first question. I, I... Again, I'm, I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure, but I, if it's me and I'm defending, I, I think if we are if this is happening quickly, yeah. if this is happening quickly, I think the centre half has to sprint back into a position where he can then turn himself round. The fact that, 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 that and get himself into a position where he can then subsequently sort of mark the attacker. So I, I don't I think you can run faster when yeah. you're when, you know if if you're in a straight line, you can still run fast when you're backing off and your shoulders parallel to the pitch. Um, but probably not as fast. I think that, again, a critical skill would be, a critical attribute would be to sprint into a position and then spin yourself around really fast. Yeah. yeah. Or as you're sprinting, make sure you're looking for where the centre are or doing your best to see where the centre centre forward is and then be able to get yourself into a position where you can see him it, it, from, from another angle. That's, the other one I want to sort of pick up on is your communication one. How much harder is it for the two centre halves to deal with one player, one forward? Than yeah, two yeah. forwards, yeah, yeah. Re re really tough one because whose man is he? You know, yeah. who takes him and when? You know, when do I take him? So again, that's when it becomes really important about your, you know, your communication as well as your your position. The the other the other thing with that, Tom, just going back one, not the communication one, but um, is that if the centre half, if that left sided centre half um, op opens up now, as as we see the the steel, if he's about to open. up, then would and I'm thinking about learners on the course questioning, questioning things which we'd want them to do. If he opens up and the other centre half opens up and the centre forward runs beyond them, is the centre forward offside? Mm. So they stood stood their ground to a point. Yeah, yeah. Again, this is like the the, the curvy the curvy shape. Yeah. So I would be saying to the. Um, the second centre half, so the centre half nearest yeah. nearest to us, he needs to be slightly deeper, yeah. half a yard deeper yeah. than, than the first centre half, because then he's able to step up because he can see the defender running in between the two of them. Yeah. Um, in, in, now, if he's if he's a if he's a step in front of that defender, then then and and the striker is behind the first sorry behind the first defender, the first defender can't see him to step up, and then and then use offside to, yeah. to sort of help him defend. So I, I, in an yeah. 
in an ideal world, I'd want the second centre half to be slightly half the yard deeper because he's in a better position to be able to see everything happening. And, and I, I agree with that. He's the, he's the one now that actually senses the danger. So yeah. if the, if the centre forward's done the first centre half, the second centre half's going to be the one who slides across and makes yeah. that challenge just before he gets it at the near post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And gets yeah. the block on. Yeah. Well, like you say, it's, it's, it's a million different things there we can we can talk about. I'll, I'll flip that one. I'll go past this one. And this, this is just, I think this is just the last thing I wanted to, to sort of talk about. So this this concept of, um, you know, structure behind the ball and defending while we attack. So we have, we, we, we've, um, we've placed a real importance this year on having some structure behind the ball when we're attacking. So um, yeah. we're, we're, we're always anticipating losing the ball. Okay. <laughs> so, so, I suppose this will give you a bit of an idea on on the, the, the way that we do it. So this this might be the way we build. So our two centre halves there. We've got a pivot. We've got two high fullbacks. We've got two side diamonds there. We've got a ten and we've got two wide strikers. So that might be a position you can see us in whilst we're building. Um, but we've all always got an M, what we call an M shape in the middle of the pitch. So we're always trying to fill the middle of the pitch to guard against transition. Yeah, and that M shape. Um, so, so yeah, so the fullbacks, there you go. They're, they're, this is the way we're building. So the fullbacks high and in, in, in between positions. The two of the side diamonds in the pockets, dependent on the opposition. The 10 also in the pockets. And then the two nines ready to to attack down the side. So, those, it's, it's, so there's an attacking sort of nature to that structure. But there's also a defensive nature in that we are ready to defend against transition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that can that can happen slightly differently. So if we're building and we're getting pressed by two, two forwards, we might drop the pivot into a central position. Yeah, so the two centre halves go a little bit wider and we play three against two rather than two against one. Sorry, rather than against two against two. So if two centre forwards are pressing our two centre halves, this may be one of the ways we get out. You know, we, we're able to help the players out. So we've got a three there, the two sides of diamonds narrow up. Yeah. And we've still got our M position. We've still got our M shape in the middle of the pitch. Yeah. So you're always protecting that central area. Then you're always we're got... always protecting the central area. So this is an yeah. example of it. So yeah. you can see that M M shape there. So this is our structure, our structure behind the ball. So we've got a fullback attacking there, trying to combine with a ten. But we've got our M shape behind the ball to try and guard against a, a, a transition. In this case, it's our side diamond, centre half, pivot, centre half, fullback. But that can be a combination of any play, any, any of the players really. But we're all we're always very keen. Or always, it's a non-negotiable for us really. So when we're attacking, we always want an M shape in the middle of the pitch, so that when it does break down, yeah. So it's broken down there. So that's just a slide on, yeah. We've got this structure behind the ball, so the side diamond then that can can can, can engage the centre half ready to defend down the side. The opposite centre half ready to help. The pivot's ready to protect the ball into the front. So it gives us a bit of structure and a bit of um, protection against that turnover that that you know a lot of teams can get done on. Yeah. So Tom, it's sorry, could you just flick back one? Even yeah. if um, and one more possibly, mate, if at all possible. So even if you were going to go uh, and attack a team who were playing a low block because you were a superior side to them, would you would you operate like a five man M shape then? Or would you be more adventurous? Uh, again, I think it's dependent on 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 the opposition, Jim. But I, I think, to be honest, for us this year, we've we've worked we've worked hard on on um, yeah having a structure behind the ball and and having a real sort of focus on defending while while we attack. So we, we've decided that we're going to attack with five and we're going to defend with five for the majority as a general sort of principle. And well, that, clearly, that can change during the game. You know, it can change with you know that might form one of our what ifs. I guess you know if we're one 0 behind, then our attacking strategy might might change differently yeah but it has, been, it has been the focus of our work because we've, we've looked at the way the senior team for instance have conceded goals this year in their in their in their progress towards qualification um a disproportionate amount of goals have come from transition from not being able to yeah. defend on transition and i know steve and gareth have done some fantastic work with the team towards the latter end of the the qualification process on on having some significant structure behind the behind the ball good thank you so that's that's about it, really, guys. Um, I, I have got a bit more, but I'm conscious that we, we've run over a li little bit. Um, but I suppose as a bit of a, um, yeah, as a bit of a, um, a, a conclusion or a 
or a sort of finish to the to, to, to the presentation. We've worked on, I suppose, four things or, or had a real focus on sort of four things throughout the year. We've, we've, we've developed, I'm trying to find the slide here, there it is. So we've developed a menu of, of sort of defending stuff or ideas that we've, we've coached the players through the course of the, of the season. Um, and, and I suppose what that process of looking at where the goals and where the chances have come from, that's really given me a good chance to sort of hone, um, yeah, hone some of my focus and really decide on what some of my interventions might be next with the group and what might some of the things we, we're going to work on as we move forward. I think, obviously, Tom is fantastic and, you know, it's great to be able to share that and obviously share it with the learners, I suppose. The big thing for uh, which we always ask them when, when we're on the courses is, right, so you've seen all that. Now take it into your context. What does it look like for you? What does yeah. it look like for you in your environment? You know, it, it, as, as you've rightly said, and we always say this is one way. There are plenty of ways and there's plenty of ways other clubs will do it. But this is our the FA at, at your at international level and the, the, the guys you're working with. Um, and John, the way the way the ladies that he works with do it. But what I would say to the learners is, OK, you've seen all that. Now we're asking you, what does a low book block look like in your environment, in the team you run? Um, and how do you set it up? And what is it that you look for? And how do you design the practices that will get the maximum um, returns of, for your players in terms of learning how to, to defend and learning what to do and, and sense in danger, etc., etc.? Yeah. et cetera? It's always, it's always, Jim. It's always that relationship between um, what you're trying to get the players better at. Um, you know, how are you going to play, and and what sort of, you know, the way that you play will clearly influence the sorts of things the players need to be good at in order to win the game. So when you're coaching and delivering a program, does your practice look like the problems the players are going to encounter encounter yeah. during the game? Is it realistic practice? So when we're playing against Ireland, are we practicing or are we giving the players an experience of defending a slightly longer cross? Yeah, and are we coaching them, you know, giving them an idea about how they might defend against that? If we're playing against Spain, that's clearly different. It might be a box cross. So does our practice address the needs of the players in yeah. relation to the challenges that they're going to come up against during the game? Brilliant, Brilliant Tom. Thank you very much anyway. Thank you, no Tom. Problem. Thank you, everybody. Thank well you. Done. Right.